Okay, we will call this meeting of the House Appropriations Education Subcommittee to order. Would like for us to open with a prayer, and Representative Amerson has agreed to offer a prayer for us. Kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for the bounty that you've blessed us with. We thank you for this opportunity to look at what's available and Father, help us to distribute it in such a way that it would be the best effort among the citizens of Georgia, especially among the children of Georgia who really cannot speak for themselves. Father, be with all that this subcommittee does and be with us in all the decisions that we make. We ask this in thy name. Amen. Thank you, Representative Amerson. We are here to hear from Teachers Retirement, Employees Retirement, Professional Standards Commission, Office of Student Achievement, DECAL, and then we have several people who have signed up for public comment. Uh, we will begin with TRS. Good afternoon. You realize I just had all those people want me to take up the full two hours just so they, they don't need to come up here. Uh, I'm Jeff <laughs> I'm Jeff Ezell. I'm the executive director of the teacher's retirement system. Uh, I just want to just take a, a moment to, to assure you that the, the system is, is operating extremely well. Uh, at the end of December, our assets uh, are up to $52.2 billion. Uh, we're up 14% 14, 14 for this fiscal year, and just the system is operating well. Uh, and with that said, in looking at the last page of your tracking document, uh, which is the, the TRS page, page 11, for fiscal year 011, the, the only uh, direct appropriated state funds represents local and floor payments to uh, individuals who retired from the small local retirement systems, uh, City of Atlanta, uh, Fulton County, Chatham County, and the City of Rome. Uh, I would like to take credit that we're, we're reducing this number, but unfortunately these individuals are very old and they're passing away uh, more and more each year. So the amount from 010 uh, was 965,000. Uh, due to the, the deaths, it's been reduced by 115,000 uh, to the amount that's being requested in, in 011 is $850,000. Uh, it's about a 12% uh, reduction. And I'll, I'll keep it simple, write that, and uh, be happy to respond to any and all questions. Out in the hall, you were talking to us about the, the performance of your fund. Did you want to uh, mention some of those numbers? Yeah, I'll, uh, uh, you know, currently at the level of the 52.2 billion, we're almost back up to the level we were back in 2007 uh, before the economy, you know, dropped, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, fiscal year 2010, our rate of return was 11.1%. Uh, the fiscal year to date, that'd be from uh, July 1 through the end of December, is 15.7%. Uh, so the system has been doing well as the uh, uh, national economy and world economies have been improving. Okay. Are there questions from the members of the committee other than what should you invest in? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Representative Amerson. Uh, Back when Enron failed, we lost quite a bit of money. <laughs> and uh, I have had a number of teachers tell me that they were not interested in allowing us to put any amount of money into uh, research and development, you know, risk, what might be considered sort of risky investments, even though they tend to have a higher rate of return. Adventure capital. Adventure capital, yeah, thank you. Um, 
Is anything coming up that we know should know about on that? Well, it's kind of funny. I was going to ask you that same question. I, I have not heard of any yeah. uh, of any legislation uh, that's been drafted uh, in regards to the uh, alternative investments yeah. uh, situation. You. All right. My second question: Are we above 100 uh, percent? Our 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 funding percent. Yes. Our our current funding per percent. And this is as of our valuation ending uh, uh, June 30, 2009. Uh, were 87.2 percent, which is still very good. I mean, just kind of a general rule of thumb uh, for pension plans: if you're if you're 80 percent or higher, you're in good shape. And you know, the key is uh, that 87 percent funded. You know, does mean their liabilities are greater than their assets, but within our contribution rates that, that y'all have always so graciously approved and given to us, you know, it's to, you know, part of that rate is to pay off that unfunded liability over a 30 year period of time. So as long as the, the contributions continue to come in from the members uh, and our employers, which is in our case, the state and local, you know, local uh, school boards, we're, we're, in, we're in great shape. Thank you. Jeff, isn't it true that if that 87 percent represents if we had to close the fund and pay off everything today, we would have money only to pay 87 percent of the? Uh, uh, is that is that how sort of how that works? You, you, kind of, sort of. I mean, you, you could look at it that way. I mean, we have assets that cover uh, 87 percent of the liabilities, you know, today. But you know, systems like us, as you know, don't just you just they just don't close and right. terminate like like a company might do their right. pension plan like a like a private company would go out of business we're not expecting the teachers of the state of georgia or this government of we're, we're going to last as long as the state of georgia lasts yeah that's, hopefully forever that's, that's, that's sort of the point i'm going to make <laughs> and, and amos back to your question we did pass a uh, a bill last year to allow alternative investments for our firefighters fund and uh I just talked with them today, and they've got some. Uh, actually, it went into effect July the first. They have not invested anything into alternative investments yet. They've taken a slow approach. I uh, met with them today, and they've got some ideas on on how they're going to go with that. And uh, over, they, they've got a 21-year projection. Uh, and if it works out the way, uh, of course, again, we're looking long term. But uh, there's there's uh, nearly 200 million dollars that will be coming into their fund over a 21 year period for a small amount less than well up, up to five percent they never they never invest more than 4.72 percent of their total fund in, in alternative investments but there's some good numbers so we're going to be sharing that with the retirement committee when we meet but anyway that's just... any other questions from committee members yes ma'am we thank you very much thank you y'all have a good afternoon Okay, next up will be Employees Retirement Pamela Ferris. And that's page 10 in the tracking sheet. I want to make sure everyone's got their list of questions I provided to ask her. <laughs> You're so funny, Representative Maxwell. <laughs> Thank you very much, I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, I'm Pamela Ferris for the Employees Retirement System, and we manage all of the pension plans and 401k plans for all of the state employees other than teachers. So what Jeff has previously talked about, we're everybody else. Um, there are two, only two funds where we actually requ request state funds. One is the Georgia Military Pension Fund, which supports our Georgia National Guard. Um, and then the public school employees retirement system, and that covers the janitors, um, the cafeteria workers, the school bus drivers around the state. Um, for the Georgia Military Pension Fund, we're requesting a slight increase in that ARC, and that is to kind of pre-fund for fiscal year 12. Um, for the Public School Employees Retirement System, we're asking for an additional $8.4 million in order to pre-fund for fiscal year 12 as well. Happening this year because of the way 
12 looks in the budget? It's the way fiscal year 12 looks. And for the public school employees retirement system, the annual required contribution is more than doubling from fiscal year 11 to fiscal year 12. So we're kind of asking for a pre-funding in order to help with the fiscal year 12 budget. Help me understand why it's um, it actually, prior to fiscal year 12, we were more than 100% um, funded in the P uh, public schools plan. When you're more than 100% funded, you can offset your annual required contribution each year. So basically, as long as you're over 100%, we've been giving a discount um, to the state so you didn't have to pay as much money. Well, now that you're not 100% funded, due then to the, mainly to the market loss, you're now having to pay the full cost of the plan. And fiscal year 12 is the first year that you're getting the full cost. Them at all? No, not to the local systems. This is truly just the public schools for those those people. What does it mean to the employee? To the employee, it does not mean anything to them. Just to us. Just to you guys. Just the taxpayers. Right. Okay. Other questions? I have one, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. Sure. Thank you, Miss. Ferris for being here and, and making this presentation. And I, I do appreciate what you do to keep all of our retirement systems going, along with uh, Mr. Ezell on the TRS side. Uh, the COA on the PSERS, now they have gotten one every year since, uh, what, 83 or so up until, was it last year? It was the first year they did not get a COA? Correct. Because uh, I know there's a lot of people that have a misunderstanding about, about the COA increase for yeah. these folks. For public school employees retirement system and the legislators retirement system, those are two where consistently you've received a COLA and the board voted against a COLA for this past year. Okay. Didn't know if anybody was aware of that. That's all. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. We're getting way ahead of schedule. I hope everybody's here. Um, I'm professional standards. We can we can make up some time here. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'll begin by briefly describing our agency's core functions and some of our current work that I think will be of particular interest to you. Our agency is charged with carrying out all work concerning the certification and licensing of almost 300,000 current certification holders. We approve all programs that prepare educators and work with colleges, universities, RESAs, and others, other providers to ensure their programs meet rigorous quality standards. Another core function is educator ethics, and we receive on average 100 new cases in educator ethics per month. We administer educator testing through the GACE tests, and we are the agency that conducts our state's Title IIA teacher quality work. Some of our work that's currently on the front burner that may be of interest to you, uh, Race to the Top. Our agency will be involved with a great deal of the Race to the Top work, including teacher career ladder new certification renewal requirements, teacher and leader preparation program effectiveness and accountability, alternative routes to leadership, Teach for America, the new teacher project, a proposed induction certificate, and a tiered model of certification. Regarding our new certification upgrade rule, our commission just passed a rule that requires advanced degrees to meet a high but attainable standard of rigor and relevance before a salary increase is attained. This rule will ensure that advanced degrees have a positive impact on educator performance. Implementation of this rule will require a great deal of work and communication, but we are committed to the success of this important rule. And the third thing will be CRCT cases. We typically receive student assessment testing cases every month. Uh, at the same time that we receive these typical cases every month, we are now working cooperatively with the special investigators and the GBI on the high profile CRCT cases that I know you've read and heard about. We expect to begin receiving these cases at, at uh, the Professional Standards Commission within the next few months. 
And the other thing that I will mention is I had the privilege uh, this past year to co-chair with Representative Carter the House Study Committee on Professional Learning, and I believe you're going to hear from Representative Carter, and I think there's some outstanding recommendations made by that study committee to you. Regarding the FY11 budget, the governor is recommending a 4% cut to our current 6.1 million state operating budget. You can find it under item 26.7 on your track sheet. We are managing this cut by ending state fund support for our master teacher program, ending state fund support for our educator recruitment function, and eliminating our research function. We have also implemented furlough days, but have done so in the fairest and least damaging way possible. The most highly compensated staff at PSC are assigned the vast majority of furlough days. I think this would be a good point to commend our entire staff at PSC. All of us know the impact of state revenues on state agencies. In spite of these difficulties, our employees have performed in an exemplary fashion, their morale has remained high, and their commitment to serve our clients has not wavered. I will conclude by telling you that as difficult as the reductions have been over the past three years, our agency has consistently been treated fairly, given the unprecedented scope of the problem. At some point when state revenues recover, we will need a budget enhancement to effectively continue to serve our customers. I know all of us look forward to that day. However, today is not that day, and our agency will do our best to assist you with your difficult task while working to provide the best possible service to all of our customers. And if you have questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good job. Ms. Tenson, appreciate that. I want to ask you a couple of questions about a couple of things that have been going on this summer. And uh, we're looking at legislation. You know, there have been three study committees, and I know yours, the one that you worked with, uh, with uh, Representative Carter, what they did. But there's another one looking on with the move on when ready, uh, allowing children of the 10th grade to move on. And there's been some talk about maybe some technical vocational teachers doing some teaching in uh, the high schools and allowing the D, and especially I'm concerned about the DTA, you know, the, those teachers. But have you been in contact, I know you have, with uh, about the certification, allowing these teachers with SACs uh, to, to be able to cross these lines of teaching a technical college or the technical college to teach in a high school? Have you been, are you, have you been in that loop? You know what we're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. Um... The Chancellor, uh, Ron Jackson, and uh, then uh, Superintendent Cox, now Superintendent Barge, uh, asked me to um, basically facilitate work on what's been deemed seamless education in the state of Georgia. Uh, this incorporates the offering of associate degrees. It inco incorporates dual enrollment issues. It incorporates articulation of course credit, which is a significant issue. Uh, it incorporates remediation issues, all of the kind of things, Representative Coleman, that, that you mentioned. Um, we had a very productive meeting a week ago. We have a meeting scheduled for next week, and we plan on having a detailed progress report uh, completed in about a week and a half. Uh, and I think we're making a lot of progress. Uh, certainly, we want student movement and accessibility in Georgia uh, to, to be without barriers. We want students to be able to move from one educational institution to another one without significant barrier. We want students to be able to change their mind about uh, career paths or educational needs and not have to duplicate coursework um, or drive 60 miles to gain access to an institution. And this is what we're working toward. We want the right courses to be articulated so that if they're taken at a TCSG institution or at a USG institution, uh, then they'll count and there will not be a duplication. Uh, we've got to, relative to move on when ready, uh, bolster our dual enrollment program and, and that one is going to fall primarily in, in your laps because it does constitute a funding issue. Right. Um, there is such potential in dual enrollment, uh, but right now 
um, LEAs cannot promote it because of the budget implications for, for local school systems. And, and that has to be addressed. So I don't want to give you the, the, the whole report right now, but, but I have been involved in that. And I think within the next week and a half or so, we should have a fairly detailed progress report on, um, on where we're moving with those items. Well, we're, we're talking, of course, we're talking about dual credit instead of the dual enrollment because we're cutting out the money, extra money, talking about the dual credit. But the concerns we have, of course, has been the, for 18 years, we've been looking, and you know, I talked with you, we talked about this, this core group of courses that the high schools would offer that both the technical and colleges would accept. And, and we're talking about this year drafting, and that's where we need to find out, you know, some legislation that will mandate this year that these 25 courses will be identified. Can that be done, Kelly? And what's at, the at least a portion what's can be obstacle? done. What's the obstacle? I'll give you a couple of examples of where you have to be careful. Yeah. Um, all of the institutions that, that we're talking about um, are accredited institutions through some accreditation process. Now, if you mandate, a, and, and I'll just okay. use this as an example, if you mandate a certain CTAE course be articulated okay. and accepted at a TCSG institution if it's taught at a high school mm -hmm. institution, and let's just say that, that that high school teacher has a high school diploma, then that you are requiring that TCSG institution to violate their accreditation okay. because the credentials of the person teaching the course would not rise to the level of what the accrediting agency would accept. Yeah. So, Representative Coleman, I'm, I'm going to give you two answers. Number one, a lot of what you've talked about can be done, but it has to be crafted carefully so that there are not unintended consequences okay for the colleges and universities that, that you're wanting to serve. Okay, we'll, we'll continue that He discussion. said I got to stay on budget, I apologize. In, in his education committee on his time. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I do have a budget question. That was the question. We're talking about, we made a promise four years ago to fund national board certification. We made a promise that we commit, our, keep our promise. Of course, budget has dropped. Are we still, if the money came back, is that loss still, because it came out of your division, what would it take to fund our promise to the National Board teachers? I'm going to make a, a rough guess, and, and please don't hold me to this. We can get the calculations on it. But I think the last time that we looked at it in terms of funding the teachers that were eligible for the um, uh, certification uh, and also those that were in the pipeline that were almost finished. Seems like it was somewhere in the 13 to 14 million dollar range and, and Christine's shaking her head yes, which means that I done good. good. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Ash. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I ask a question that's been asked, just tell me that I wasn't here. It seems to me that over the past several years, you've been doing more and more and more with less and less and less. I mean, it, it's just been amazing to watch what the PSC is accomplishing. Are there any replacement dollars that come through things like Race to the Top to help you get this job done? Yes and no. Um, we are going to be receiving a very small amount of Race to the Top dollars. Um, and, and I can describe exactly where we're getting those dollars if you want me to. Uh, we are going to be getting dollars to change our master teacher program from state funding to federal funding through Race to the Top. We are getting dollars to employ one position to manage our Race to the Top work. That's one position. But we're grateful for that one position, okay? Uh, we are going to be getting Race to the Top dollars uh, to um, manage the IT work that has to be done because, of course, and, and Representative Ash, you and I have had this conversation on several occasions, uh, the development of a statewide longitudinal data system is, has got to be priority 1A. Uh, the, rest of our, the rest of our work can't be done properly without that data system. 
And so we are getting some IT dollars to do that work. Uh, Christine, am I leaving anything big out re regarding race to the top? I believe that's it. So Representative Ash, those are all the race to the top dollars we're getting. I will tell you that the vast majority of those dollars are going to go specifically to race to the top work and aren't going to help us get quote unquote PSC work done. Now with, with IT, we may can use some dollars for race to the top work and it may have a dual purpose. It may help us with something at PSC um, just uh, coincidentally, if you will. But we're going to be real careful with the dollars to make sure they're expended in, in a manner in which they were given to us. So yes, we're getting race to the top dollars, but no, they really don't have a significant impact on doing our core mission work at PSC. Uh, because we have to use them for the specific purposes that they were granted. And there was another grant earlier for IT. Did you get that grant as well? Uh, not to the best of my knowledge, no. That was DOE. That's all DOE. Um, a, a final question. Sure. And, Mr. Chairman, I don't think it has to do with money. But when are we going to have this IT system that works? Well, I'm not the person that's primarily responsible for that, but, but I will tell you this, and, and this is a, a kind of a general answer. We've got some people in place now that haven't been in place during previous attempts. And we've got some people in place now that, that I have a pretty high level of confidence in that are going to get the job done. And so I cannot make any guarantees, but I'm more optimistic that we're going to be successful this time than I've been over the past 20 years. I really am much more optimistic because we've got some good people in place. Okay. Maybe in our lifetime, huh? Maybe. Maybe. Are there further questions? Yes. Uh, actually, we've got one. Here first. Okay. Representative, Representative Kaiser. I just wanted to get a I didn't get two good fans out there among the third among everybody else on the committee, but I did want to ask about how school today where we get an incentive for math and science teachers. With your cuts and teacher recruitment, how big of an impact is that having on the success we had hoped that bill would have? Well, the bill is just now, I believe that I read that uh, it's going to be funded through the supplemental budget, if I, if I read that correctly. And again, Christine's nodding yes, so I'm, I'm real glad. Um, and so the impact can't be seen yet because it hasn't been funded yet. But I, I will mention two things real briefly. Even during these times of diminished teacher slots and um, and not, not growth in the number of teachers that, that school districts are hiring, et cetera, we still see a need for math and science. There are, there are right now in Georgia only three critical shortage areas. And those three critical shortage areas, actually there are four, I'm sorry, are special education, Spanish, math, and science. So the need is still present. I will also tell you that when the economy turns, you're going to at some point um, make some adjustments with pupil-teacher ratios to get them back to where we all want them to be. School districts are going to begin to hire uh, some supplemental teachers that they've been able to hire in the past that they can't hire now. Employees are going to be more confident to retire because we've seen very few retirements over the past two or three years. And then we're going to see um, a, a kind of an explosion relative to the teacher job market. And so I, I think that um, the part of House Bill 280 that deals with workforce uh, is still as needed today as it was. The other part of T80 de 280 deals with teacher quality in terms of math and science and elementary teaching, and, and to, that's my favorite part of the bill. I think that's an outstanding part of the bill. So I really commend you for um, looking at, at funding that at this time. Representative Averson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Over the Christmas holidays, I read a number of articles uh, that said certain states had determined that the administrative costs and so forth of dealing with this race to the top 
uh, they determined it wasn't worth it, so they sent the money back. Ohio, I think, was the biggest one. They returned over $400 million worth. So my question is, okay, you get a staff that can handle all of the paperwork needed. Uh, what do we do with this staff after Race to the Top's over? Well, I'm probably not the person to answer that, but I'll, I'll give you a, a two cents answer on a dollar question, if you will. Uh, the, the staff that's been employed for Race to the Top, uh, my understanding is, is fully understanding the length of time of the contract. We, we have now are, are in the final stages of employing our one Race to the Top employee. We've made it very clear to this employee that it's essentially a three and a half year position. So there's, there's nothing misleading as far as I know in, in the employment of these folks. Uh, and I really think one of the folks in state government that I have as much confidence in as anybody is Teresa McCartney. I think Teresa is outstanding. Uh, she's hardworking, she's bright, she's common sensed. She, she does a fabulous job and she's the implementation director for Race to the Top. And I think in terms of administrative overhead and, and money not going to where it should be going, I have as much confidence in Teresa as anybody on the planet that she's gonna manage that well. Thank you. You know, I would say, uh, Representative Averson, that perhaps the bigger question is where do the funds come from to implement statewide what we are looking at in, is it 26 systems? 26 systems. And, and uh, the amount of money that's tied up in staff with Race to the Top is minuscule compared to what the cost of going statewide with some of what is being piloted. In, in those 26 systems. And of course, that's always the, the difficulty with a pilot program. Uh, we, we pilot some really wonderful things that we'll never have the money to implement. So uh, we, we, that's just what we have to consider. I, I don't see any more lights on, to, okay. uh, and, and I want to congratulate you. You managed single-handedly to get us back on schedule. <laughs> uh, Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Yes. <laughs> no, we weren't behind when you came up. <laughs> Kathleen. Good afternoon. She's My name is page two of your tracking sheet. I'm sorry, Kathleen. Thank you. The bottom of page two with the Office of Student Achievement. Um, we continue at the Office of Student Achievement to do the work with which you are already familiar, the annual state education report card and scoreboard, uh, standard setting on assessments, uh, academic audit work, IE squared performance contracts, research, those sorts of things. But like the Professional Standards Commission, we have assumed a new set of responsibilities within Race to the Top. And those are completely separate, of course, to the existing responsibilities, but related. And we'll be working specifically within the development of comprehensive evaluation models for teachers, for school leaders, for districts, for preparation programs. Um, I hear an awful lot in the, the news about evaluation being based on a single piece of test data, and our role in this is to make sure that absolutely does not happen, that we work on the development of a very comprehensive system that takes a lot of different things into consideration. So we'll be very involved in that aspect. Um, Representative Ash, to your question about the data system work, we'll also be very involved in that massive undertaking that has quite a history with it. Um, but the responsibility that we have assumed that I think will be of the most interest to you and direct benefit to you, um, Chairman Dixon goes back to a comment that you just made about what do you do at the end of this grant mm -hmm. when you've got 26 systems who have volunteered to be a part of this discussion to figure out in a low stakes environment um, some new ways of doing things. And so the Office of Student Achievement is going to have two employees that are measuring and evaluating all of those different initiatives so that at the end of the grant, we are able to come to you with some data and some evidence to say, we tried a lot of different things. Some of those showed a lot of potential and a lot of effectiveness while others unfortunately did not. And so we can share with you what we think perhaps might take priority when you think about scaling some efforts across the state at the end of the grant period. Okay. I'll, I'll ask a, a question first, I guess. 
the race to the top is funding much of what you just talked about in, in, in your department. It, the salary money that's coming to you, is it all with new personnel or is it funding some of existing personnel? It's entirely new. Okay. Other questions? Yes, sir. Representative Maxwell. Do you know the dollar amount of the race to the uh, top funds you're getting? Do you have a dollar amount? Uh, I don't have an exact dollar amount. I could go back and, and try to see specifically what we're getting. Um, it, it's initiative by initiative. So, for example, within the data system project, there's probably all told over $40 million going to that effort. What's coming to my agency specifically is a very, very small piece of that. And so I, I could go back and it's get okay. that information for you. Kaiser has. Representative Kaiser. Representative Ash. Your efforts in evaluation of race to the top efforts and IT work fit with all the other agencies that are seemingly having pieces of the pie. How, how do you know what's going on at the PSC and what's going on at DOE and, and how do you work together? That's a lot of the communication that's being developed right now. Um, it's, it's a massive effort. It's not just across our state education agencies, but as Mr. Henson alluded to, there's work with Teach for America and the new teacher project and seismic and communities and schools. And it's keeping track of all those individual efforts and what they're doing and what data we can collect to see if we're making meaningful differences within those efforts. So it's a, it's a very conscious and deliberate communication effort to keep everyone talking to one another and aware of the different work that's happening. The vast majority of it is collaborative across our state agencies. So you very rarely are going to find just the Department of Education working on something. More than likely, uh, Office of Student Achievement, Professional Standards Commission will be working as well. And when you're deciding if something's working or not, is student achievement the thing you're looking at or what else gets involved in the evaluation? Um, student achievement, specifically with uh, the work we're doing within our lowest performing schools, that's obviously going to be almost the exclusive focus. We want to see if we're really turning around the achievement in those schools. Um, within the evaluation systems, we are um, got to be looking at the, the different components that go into those systems and see within a classroom observation instrument, a growth model, um, quantitative based surveys, that the results that we're getting from those things are all pointing in the same direction. Is this saying the same thing about effectiveness for a particular teacher or school leader as one of the other indicators is saying and do we then have confidence in that system? I think the last thing we want to do is put a system in place that we don't have confidence in that we haven't done the validation work for and our teachers and leaders don't feel comfortable being evaluated by that system. I think that has to be at the forefront. And are teachers and leaders involved in, at the table in figuring out how do you relate an achievement test score to a classroom observation to a, whatever else is involved in so that they have a stake in the game? They are. We had a kickoff meeting yesterday specifically related to teacher evaluation and uh, value-added growth models. And we had, uh, within our 26 partner districts, each brought three participants to the um, conversation. And teachers and principals made up, I'd say, the bulk of that participation. Um, from this place forward, we'll have committees that work on the development then we go back to our local partners, we share that information, they in turn share with their teachers and principals, we then hold webinars to gather input and feedback from them, and we regroup to figure out what the next steps are. So we are very, very committed to communication with teachers and school leaders and making sure that they have buy-in to this process. We've had a number of questions, not just with uh, Kathleen, but with PSC too, uh, or things that, that really go beyond the scope of this committee. And I, I, they're good questions. Uh, and I'm hopeful that uh, even though the chairman of the Education Committee has departed, dearly departed, uh, <laughs> that, we'll, that we will have the opportunity to pursue some of these things within that Education Committee. Because I think that, sure. that, that while they may not be 
crucial to the budget decisions that we're going to make. They are crucial to what the education decisions are going to be. But uh, having said that, one of the things that is of interest to this committee is, is not necessarily how you've allocated race to the top funds, but how it interlaces with the funds that we are having to be responsible for. It. And it would be helpful, I think, if, if we could see uh, the budget, for instance, for race to the top as it relates to your agency and, mm -hmm. and maybe to PSC, so that we can see how, how those dovetail with what funds sure. we've got here. Uh, if you can accommodate that for I'm us. happy to provide that. In fact, I just uh, received a first draft of that from Teresa McCartney uh, within the past few days, and I, I can't speak for Kelly Henson, but he may have also received something similarly, and I'm happy to share that information. Okay. Did Kelly leave us? Yeah. Let's vote him now. Pardon? Well, she's DOE, but I mean, our committee really has nothing to do with, with race to the top funds. I mean, we, we could certainly, as an informative thing, ask her if she would mind coming to see us, but we, we, don't, uh, we don't influence or decide how those funds are, are manipulated or spent. Right. So, back to Representative Amy's question, we're talking about are either going to be used to do things we're already doing or to do new things and how that money stream is going to continue when those dollars disappear because last year we mm -hmm. spent lots of time saying we don't really have anything to do with the stimulus money it's just coming but next year we're going to spend a whole lot of time figuring out what to do with the hole and i'm just fearful that race to the top is going to also leave a hole for us to dig out of Okay, valid point. Point well taken. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Good job. And now we have, we have a new fellow on the block. Cagle, welcome to, uh, to our meeting and congratulations on your new position. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having me today. Page five of 11 in your big packet is where you'll find the tracking sheet for this. Thank you. Thank you. Leslie's providing you with a uh, chart depicting the um, uh, budget makeup. Yes, sir. Well, it's too late, I've already interrupted her. <laughs> she just suggested that because you are new to these people, uh, that you might want to introduce a little bit of, and let them know who you are and what your background is. Okay. Uh, my name is Bobby Cagle. Um, my background uh, is uh, um, primarily in social work. I um, most recently came from the Division of Family and Children's Services where I did legislative and external affairs uh, for the last couple of years. Um, I've also done uh, a lot of policy work within the division. I was their family services director in charge of child welfare policy and programming for two years prior to that. Um, and then prior to that, I have a, a management background in local county departments of social services, ranging in size from um, uh, a very, very small county in western North Carolina to uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg, which is the largest uh, county in the state. Um, and prior to that, uh, uh, I was in corrections. I was a probation officer, also worked, as, uh, worked my way up to a district manager with the North Carolina Division of Community Corrections. Uh, and very happy to be here today. Um, the um, um, department is one that uh, serves a, an extremely important function, as, a, as uh, I know you're aware. Um, the uh, annual budget uh, that we have in the document uh, that Leslie provided you is depicted in a chart just to give you an idea of exactly where the money comes from. Uh, it's about a $513 million uh, budget. 70% of that comes from lottery funds. 30% um, of that or 29% of that comes from federal funding. And then you'll see that the state funding portion uh, of the uh, budget is uh, $1.2 million or 0.25 percent of uh, the overall budget. The um, uh, other thing that Leslie asked me to uh, remind you of is that um, uh, 
in FY10 amended budget, we had three quarters of our state funding uh, that was uh, removed in an amount of about $3 million. Um, and um, so that's the context that we're working in. Is, is she trying to tell us we're insignificant? <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, we're telling you you're very significant. Otherwise, we won't have any state funds. Um, if you will, refer to, your, uh, to page five of the House tracking document. Um, and uh, the first um, items are items 21.1, which is a workers' compensation line item, uh, and 21.2, uh, 21.1.2, which is telecommunications. These are adjustments that were required of every agency by OPB. And the next items, uh, these were offered as full 8% reductions um, that, were, that were required by the governor's office in item 21.1.3. Uh, we were able to um, take a look at the way we used our federal funding uh, and actually fund a portion of the, uh, and probably the larger share of uh, the expense for one of our attorneys at, that does a lot of USDA work uh, in our federal nutrition programs. In item 21.1.4, um, we eliminated one IT position that was effective August 2010. The final item is in the pre-K program, uh, item 21.3.1. Uh, that was an adjustment for workers' comp that was also taken by OPB. Be glad to answer any questions. I expect there'll be some. Representative Ash. On time yesterday with DOE talking about school nutrition. Yes. And I see a nutrition number here. These are state dollars. That, actually, those are federal dollars. They're all federal dollars. Yes. No state dollars at all. Correct. And to whom do you provide nutrition support? Where do the dollars go? Nutrition uh, happens in the both the child care settings and uh, pre-K programs. Uh, and that we administer, and it also goes to summer food programs, which are administered through nonprofits around the state. Could we get a breakdown of how those work and in, in what number of nonprofits were involved with last year's summer food program? We'll be glad to get you that. That'd be very helpful. We'll provide the whole committee with that, please. And, and what are the requirements for getting those dollars? Absolutely. Be glad to. Questions? Question I've not heard that I expected to hear is no additional slots projected in the amended. In the amended budget, budget. no, or there. Cuts of slots. Right. Exactly. Do we have waiting lists currently? We do. We have unfilled slots. We do. We have um, uh, in um, uh, December, I think we had about 9,783 slots. Um, that uh, are um, uh, people on the waiting list. Um, and so we're actually serving about 82,000, in excess of 82,000 with 84,000 slots funded. So we're maintaining about 98 to 99% uh, fill rate for the slots that we have uh, with around 10,000 uh, additional uh, um, young people that would like to be in the program and their parents would like to get them in. Any other questions? Very good. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Okay, that's the last of the agencies that are scheduled to speak. We have three people who have signed up to make public comment. Beginning with Marcus Downs. As you uh, as you, uh, those of you who are going to be doing public comment, if you introduce yourselves as you start, would be helpful to the committee. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to address the committee. My name is Marcus Downs. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the Georgia Association of Educators. And uh, we just wanted to share some of our thoughts on the, uh, on the budget process. First off, we, we'd like to thank you again for this opportunity to address this committee. And uh, we applaud the budget proposals that have been set forth. We are we're excited to see that there's no tampering with the QBE funding. 
Uh, that, ma that makes us excited, and uh, we're glad to see that's taking place. But, but we also want to go on record as willing to work with the legislature and the governor in this process. We definitely want to be a part of the solution, and we want to have an opportunity to bring any um, creativity to the process as well. There are a couple of issues that I would like to, to point out, though, that, um, that, that if there's anything that can be done, we hope that you'll uh, address these issues. And one of the issues is school nurses. We notice that there's going to be a decrease in the funding uh, provided for school nurses. And our major concern is uh, there's a potential liability issue because what we'll have uh, if we lose some of our nurses are uh, classroom teachers that are now tasked with uh, providing medical care. And in many cases, uh, if not all cases, they are likely to be uh, untrained in, in providing that type of care. And we'd hate to see um, there be any liability that teachers and that the state has to face um, because of this lack of funding. Uh, one of the other issues that we'd like to also address is pupil transportation. And we know that's been a, a point of contention for, for several years, and, and we're, we're very well aware of the challenges that we face here in the state. Um, but we've also seen a, a number of safety issues taking place regarding bus safety uh, even over the past several months. And so in that, uh, we are actually requesting um, bus monitors and video cameras be placed on buses that are manufactured uh, after 2012. And we're willing to uh, stretch that to 2013. Um, one of our pieces is that we, we don't believe this has an immediate fiscal impact. Um, it just demonstrates the legislature's intent uh, to provide safe transportation for our children and to make sure that our bus drivers, who are often at a ratio 1 to, to 50 on a bus, uh, have, have a safe driving environment. Um, well, the bus monitors would have a, a long term. They, they would. They would. We acknowledge that. Uh, bus, the cameras are, would be pretty much a one time right. expense. Okay. Right. Just wanted to make sure that I was. That's the right kind of monitor you were talking about. Yes, sir. We'd actually like a physical monitor, uh, but, but we believe that's probably a local's decision, and so we, we wouldn't uh, present that to you all. But while we're asking, we might as well put, <laughs> put it out there. Uh, we, we'd like to applaud TRS and ERS for the work that they're doing, and we want to encourage um, uh, the, the executive leadership of TRS and ERS, as well as, as this committee, uh, to, to retain the defined benefit plans that, uh, that our employees have, have enjoyed for the past several years. It is still an excellent recruiting and retention tool, and we'd like to see those remain in place. Um, one of the other pieces that we'd like to talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, going on record that, that we oppose uh, any notion of public funds going to, uh, to fund private entities. And uh, we, we haven't seen anything like that as of yet, but we, we want to go on record that we uh, are fully supportive of, of public dollars going to fund public entities. Um, and, and, and finally, we'd like to, to make sure that we're also on record saying that we'd like to be a part of any um, evaluation tool development. Uh, we, we'd definitely like to make sure that, that the people on the front line have feet under the table, uh, have an opportunity to weigh in, uh, I definitely applaud uh, the, the representative from OSA. Our president was present at the meeting that they held on yesterday, and uh, we, we believe that was a productive meeting. And uh, we'd also like to offer uh, our services as part of a national affiliate. Uh, we have uh, empirical and anecdotal evidence from all 50 states uh, regarding different proposals that may find themselves uh, before you, and we'd like to be able to let you know that, that we're able to provide real life experience on how successful or uh, unsuccessful these plans have been. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, of course, one or two of those things uh, you'll need to come back to Representative Coleman's committee and, Certainly. Uh, and try to convince him. <laughs> Several of the things you mentioned certainly were on the list of each of the members of the committee that I've talked to, uh, I think there's significant concern amongst all of us about cuts in the nurses' funding and, and what the end result of that can be. So uh, we appreciate your comments. Does anybody have any questions? I do. Yes, sir. <laughs> Go ahead. Hey, Marcus. How are you, sir? Uh, you, you mentioned transportation and you talked about the safety issues other than the, you know, the video cameras and monitors. That's uh, 
uh, and I know that is to me a local local system issue. But what do you see as far as safety? I mean, where, have you had a problem with that, or is there? I mean, I haven't heard of any particular, you know, but, real problems out here. And I, I, I definitely hate to put anyone on the spot, but uh, Representative Neal uh, and I had a conversation uh, several months ago. And, and he was able to, uh, to share with me an experience that he had on one of his buses. Uh, one of the things that, that we often find is uh, if there's a, an event that takes place on the back of a bus, sometimes you won't be able to find out what it is without a videotape. And you'll get, of course, 50 different stories from 50 different kids that were on the bus. And this would allow us to, to corroborate the truth and, uh, and make sure that, you know, one, the kids are safe and the, the kid that doesn't belong on the bus is no longer on that bus, but it'll also make sure that that bus driver uh, who may have been falsely accused is, uh, is exonerated as well. I, I understand the, the issue there, and I know that's been going on since I rode Lonzo Jones's bus back in the 50s. So, uh, you know, there's always been bus problems. I don't know and you got a question. exactly where, what the answer is on all those. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Representative Kaiser. Thank you, question. Mr. Chairman. I was actually uh, waiting for my other chairman in the room to ask this question, but um, I'm just curious with the empirical data nationally that you, that you have developed, because um, our chairman asked this yesterday, if you have any um, data on other systems, um, nationally, by uh, state, that yes. use public transportation, question. and how successful it would be. And and what I can do is put a question out to our national affiliate, and uh, I, I particularly start with individual uh, states in the southeastern region to find out. When when that question was raised, one of the issues that I immediately thought about was a potential liability. Uh, who's going to be liable if, in fact, there's an accident? For you know, public school children that are on public transportation, but I can I can get some data together and get back with you. Uh, yeah, Marcus, I, you know I know that uh, Representative Neal and myself both drove school buses at one point in our careers, and uh, there's I think lunchroom cook is the only job in the school system that I didn't have at one point or another. But of all of those. And I did assist. I did assist the cooks occasionally. I was a food taster. That's what happened to workers' comp. <laughs> I drove a school bus uh, for several years. Of all the jobs I held in the school system, the most stressful job was driving a school bus. It's the only job probably you will find where you've got 50 to 60 potential problems, and all of them are behind you. And your only way to see them is look in the mirror. And when you do that, there's more problems that you're not looking at that are in front of you. So uh, school bus safety is a real concern for me, too. It, uh, occasionally, we have tragic accidents within our state. Uh, but having said that, it's still true that riding a school bus is the single safest method of transportation of anything, cars, trucks, buses. Airplanes, trains, planes, trains, what's the other thing? Automobiles. So we, we appreciate your concerns there, and it looks like my. Yeah, I, I just want to follow up on that. I, um, as a school bus driver, I had a, I drove a, a 90 passenger bus. Uh, by, by law, that, that bus could have 20% over. I got, by law, I got to have 108 students on that bus. And there were many times that I left a school with 100 students on that bus, an elementary school with 100 students on that bus, and I was the only adult on there. Um, so uh, absolutely, they're, they're and, and, and I can tell you, and I, I know there are other things to consider along with that, but, but I can tell you, having that camera on the bus does impact those students' behavior um, and, and there are times that having a camera on a bus will protect the driver um, as well as protecting those students. One thing that we did in our county when we, when we first put uh, cameras on buses, I think we bought just a handful of cameras and we put boxes with red lights in every other bus. Yeah. Um, and, and only four or five of the buses actually had a camera in there, but it, it impacted every route in that, in that county just having those boxes on there. <laughs> 
Yeah, that, that worked until you had a problem on the bus and then you had to explain, well, no, the camera wasn't working that day. So, yeah. It's a faulty camera, just, yeah. Thank you, Marcus. Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll be sure to get that information to you as well. Thank you. Okay, Mike Angstadt. I wouldn't to say anything. Uh, I'm Helen Slope, and I'm with Nelson Mullins, Riley and Scarborough, and I spoke to you all yesterday yes. afternoon briefly. Um, I'm here on behalf of Multi-Agency Alliance for Children and its member organizations and Youth Villages Inner Harbor Campus. And yesterday we were here to talk a little bit about the Residential Treatment Center funding that is in the budget. It's under the non-quality um, QBE formula grants that you will find in your tracking document. There's a cut proposed of just slightly over $154,000. I believe you can find that um, in 23.13 uh, on page 7 of your, of your tracking sheet. I have with me um, Teresa Stoker, who is the CEO of Hillside and it's here in Atlanta, and I would like to let Ms. Stoker kind of give you uh, some background about what these facilities actually do in terms of providing educational instruction. I think that might be helpful based on some of the questions that were raised yesterday. Thank you for allowing us to uh, address this issue. Uh, Hillside is, uh, if not the oldest, one of the oldest nonprofits operating in the state of Georgia. We take pr great pride in the fact that we serve Georgia's children. Our children are severely emotionally disturbed. They are children that cannot often be served in the public school sector because of their severe behavioral or psychiatric issues. We have 74 beds on our Atlanta campus. We're probably 10 minutes from here and we generally never have an empty bed. The demand is extremely high for our services. Um, several years ago, uh, I was part of the supporting uh, team for Senate Bill 618 being passed. To give you a little history, we um, are funded by Medicaid. Medicaid doesn't cover any educational expenses. It is very specific to psychiatric treatment. So we have to serve our children in our school, on our campus, and that funding has to come from somewhere. And uh, we received over the years a very small amount of funding from DHR. I think it was $21 a day, which grossly did not meet the cost of educating children in a small classroom with a certified teacher and often one to two aides in a classroom of seven or eight. So it's very expensive. Uh, and we are also held to the same standards uh, of the city of Atlanta school system, same curriculum, same testing requirements, all of the things that are required of a, of a, a child in a classroom in, in APS, we are required to meet and add on top of that the fact that our children are severely emotionally disturbed and often very disruptive in the classroom. I mean, I can't even imagine having our kids on anybody's school bus, <laughs> you know, cameras or not. Um, I'd be willing to answer any additional questions you might have regarding the services that we provide. Um, in the cost from Medicaid and the other providers and Ed, could you sort of break that down, like okay. uh, how much time, for instance, if they only pay you $21 per child per day, that, pro that doesn't cover very much. No, it doesn't. And you, you have food and all these other things. Can you sort of break down a day and who pays for what? Okay. We get a small amount of funding for to supplement our food budget from the federal government. It's about $9,000 a month. Our, federal, our bills for food are generally uh, a lot more than that. We spend probably close to $500,000 a year uh, feeding the children three meals a day and a snack. Uh, and 
the only other funding is Medicaid funding that is, that is assigned specifically to a child that is Medicaid eligible. About 90% of our 74 children are Medicaid funded. We get a very few children who are insurance, have any kind of insurance coverage. Most of our children are indigent. Many, about half of them are in DFAC's custody. So there isn't any insurance dollars one can tap into. Uh, the only other funding out there is the residential treatment grant and QBE funding. And those are earmarked specifically for educational uh, services at our organization. Anything that medication cost, uh, their clothing, everything else comes out of, of either contributions that we get. I'm constantly fun fundraising to fill in the difference to buy coats for our kids in the wintertime. Uh, but the care, the psychiatric care and treatment comes specifically from the $370 a day that Medicaid provides for us. Our actual cost per day to, to provide treatment for our children is over $400 a day. So I have to fundraise the difference, and we do get some United Way funds. And that, over the last few years, has been cut due to their, um, their contributions being way down. In terms of education, the teachers that you have to hire uh, have to be fully certified, just like? Highly qualified, right. certified teachers, yes, sir. OK. And uh, how much time on each day does a teacher spend with a child? I mean, you know, you go to our, our school, uh, runs from like 8.30 to 3 o'clock. And how, how is this? Ours is exactly the same. Our children start school at 8.30 in the morning. They have a break for lunch. They're back after lunch for school until 3.30. And then we don't include any PE time, anything like that in the academic day. That, that occurs after the two, school day is over. And so therefore your uh, education money is strictly for this period of time from 8.30 to 3.30? Yes, sir. And the uh, nutrition, that is the lunch, if that comes out of the education pocket versus the breakfast and dinner, which come from another pocket of money. The, the money that we're re reimbursed by USDA covers the lunch. Okay. Or some of it. Thank you. Sure. Anything else? Representative, Kaiser. It orig the first year that we received it, I believe it was about 550000 It's about half that now. Where does that come from? And that, com that comes from... Um, it's not QBE. Yeah. Okay, but that, okay. Thank and you. that's just a broad use. Okay. And that, the intent on that was that the QBE funding doesn't pay for what it cost us to operate the school. And so that funding is to supplement that. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Thank you. Penny Honeycutt. That Penny Honeycutt couldn't be here. She would want to get into the arms of her children as well. Okay. That's the three people who are signed up to speak. Members of the committee. Um, if you have questions that come up in your mind between now and next week, if you'll let me know, we'll try to get answers for you. We will be meeting at some point early next week to uh, look at voting out this with whatever changes you propose that you're willing to fund. <coughs> okay. Anything else, members? No, he has until I leave tomorrow. Yes, and, uh, and, and you know, and then then we'll send one of those state patrolmen over to DOE. I need backup. <laughs> How was your other question? Yeah, where, where, who, yeah, who spent their money? Okay, this meeting is adjourned.